Thanks, everyone. Thanks for the uh, introduction, uh, Professor Chazen. Um, so my name is Adrian. Uh, I have been in the space for quite a few years. I started in about 2017, 2018, working for Consensus, uh, working on open source development tooling on the Truffle team. Um, so this Consensus with the Y, C-O-N-S-E-N-S-Y-S. -S -S. Um, at the time, we were doing we we're just focusing on open source tools to help developers build on top of the blockchain, specifically, uh, you know, helping people to build Ethereum smart contracts. Uh, after two years there, around 2020, I started my own DeFi protocol. Um, uh, it was called Pickle Finance with a couple of friends. And then after that, I started another DeFi protocol, uh, DFX Finance. And I can get into more details about what these things are, but um, you know, after a few years of that, now I'm with the Ethereum Foundation working on zero knowledge proof uh, ecosystem development and just helping grow the community. So I'm really happy to be here to see all you guys. Hopefully, you know, what, what I talk about today will be interesting and exciting so that, you know, you don't get uh, too tired waiting for dinner. Um, and uh, let's, uh, let's get started. There's about 39 slides and, uh, you know, feel free to put your questions in the chat anytime. I can stop and pause and, and explain things. And of course, at the end of the presentation, if you have any questions, uh, I'm also very happy to, to answer that. So let's let's get into it. Um, I promise to you know, make this as exciting as we can. So this, the presentation is called Evolution of DeFi. We, it's really more just like the introduction to DeFi uh, as, as I know it through the last few years. Um, you know, DeFi really only started uh, very recently, right? Because the blockchain is very recent, but DeFi um, really only started when we were able to make smart contracts interact with other smart contracts. Like three, four years ago, when people built smart contracts, everything was very self-contained. So you, you never use other tokens and things like that. But starting about in 2019, I would say, that's when people started to uh, build things on top of each other. And that's when all of these things that I'm talking about today uh, became possible. So, uh, this is the agenda for today. Uh, we're going to have a very short introduction about what is DeFi, um, you know, some of the, the jargon maybe, and also understanding the basics of why DeFi is important. Um, number two, we're going to talk about the foundational concepts. So there's going to be, I think, four or five different concepts that we talk about that are very basic building blocks in DeFi. Um, and then beyond that, we're going to talk about um, the governance side of things, the different types of governance that operates within DeFi protocols, and also some of the risks, like the security issues and things we have to be concerned with when we're working with DeFi. And, and then we'll close this out with a very brief conclusion just to summarize everything, and then we can go into a question period. Now, here we go. This is the introduction section. Uh, just to talk about it, because I know everyone is, um, you know, of different levels, so, so we're just going to get that in out of the way. What is DeFi? Right. Well, first of all, it's something that is peer to peer. It's a financial system that's built on the blockchain that enables, enables people to interact with each other directly. So there's no need for intermediaries like banks or institutions. You don't, there's no financial broker or things like that. You can interact directly with each other through the, the centralized network called the blockchain. Right. And that's point number two. Right. These are decentralized networks that enable all of this. Um, they operate on the smart contracts, and, and that is what makes them trustless, transparent, and permissionless. Um, everyone can see what the code is doing, and everyone interacts with it, and there's no one person that controls it. Um, and later on, we'll talk about certain exceptions to this, um, but you know that's why it's important to have the code out in the open uh, so that people can trust it. And of course, one of the most important things about DeFi is um, universal access, right? Sometimes, uh, you know, in certain countries, um, you know, people don't have access to regular banking systems, or some places maybe the bank is not open on a Saturday and Sunday. And these are really big problems, um, especially if if you want to do very basic things, like I, I need to send you money, you know, why do we have to wait for Monday 9 a.m. for everything to open? We have the technology to do all these things right away. Um, and of course, sometimes some countries they don't allow their citizens to have a lot of access to these things, or there is like a lot of issues where um, if the government doesn't like you, then you no longer have access to a normal banking system. So these are all very important and, and interesting aspects to DeFi, and that's why we're talking about it today, right? Um, we, we often ask the question, 
um, especially with people not so familiar with blockchain, um, you know, what are the differences, right? So, you know, on the left here, we have uh, an explanation of, it's basically a comparison between traditional finance, and here I've shortened it to call TradFi and decentralized finance, DeFi, right? You know, that's what it stands for, decentralized finance. So TradFi and DeFi, these are terms that people use within the industry as well. So like I said before, you know, there's a difference of intermediaries, right? There's people that are in between. Um, there is a bit of a centralized control and authority. Either it could be a bank or a government that allows or does not allow you to do things. Um, and there's also the accessibility of things like, like we talked about as well. You know, as long as you have an internet connection, you can use decentralized finance. You can use DeFi. Um, with uh, more traditional finance, sometimes there can be very long processing times. I don't know if anyone has tried to send money from, from one country to another country. Uh, you know, depending on the country, it can take several business days, right? But with DeFi, I can send you something in less than one minute. And, and I think you know, now we live in a world of computers and internet. That's something that you know, should be normal, right? Um, it, it doesn't take me... Well, several days to send you an email, right? A letter through email. So why should it take that long to send for me to send you $20, right? Um, that's the kind of world we look at today. And I think, you know, a lot of people question, you know, oh, is blockchain going to be a thing? Is it going to fail? I think it must, it will 100% must succeed in my opinion, because, you know, you're not going to turn off your email forever and go back to writing plain letters, right? And in the same way, you know, I'm used to sending money to my friends using DeFi, uh, using these blockchain ways, um, and I'm not going to go back to using a traditional way if I can have a much more uh, user-friendly and efficient way to, to do things um, that, you know, is just a better experience for everyone involved. So it's, it's really important to talk about why DeFi matters, right? Because it gives us access, right? Everyone can use it. It gives us the freedom, the ability to you know, uh, kind of express what we need to do, not only in terms of like freedom of speech, but the freedom of, of um, association. So if I want to send money to help my mother in a different country, no one can stop me from doing that. And, and also democracy, right? Because it allows people to vote with their dollars and talk about where we can and these. So it, I mean, it, it can get very political. Uh, I personally am not super political, but, you know, I think these are all, all like very important values to understand when you're talking about the industry as well, because I think these are some values that people in the industry really believe in. So with that uh, said, uh, you know, we can end the introduction part. Um, I'll pause real quickly. If there's any um, questions, you can drop them in the chat right now. I can answer right now. Um, if not, I can also continue. I'm, I'll have a sip of my drink here. Okay, sounds like everyone um, is pretty happy so far. Okay, so we'll go forward with the uh, foundation aspect. Now, one of the really important building blocks in decentralized finance is stable coins, right? So what are stable coins? Stable coins can be um, any kind of token that is... Um, backed by something or, or actually, sorry, it's any kind of token that is pegged to a specific uh, currency or uh, a value of something else. Um, a lot of people think it has to be pegged to like a US dollar. Um, that's not always the case. There are stable coins that peg to, for example, the price of gold or, or a stable coin that pegged to uh, the price of a, a stock, like a Tesla stock or something, Apple stock, right? These are all technically still stable coins. But 99% of the time in the current industry, stable coins, we are talking about um, tokens that have the same value or are trying to target the same value as the US dollar. I, I think probably the next generation uh, is going to be talking about having stable coin that is targeting, um, pegging different other fiat currencies. So maybe like the euro, you know, the British pound, the Korean won. Um, you know, I think we, we, those kind of stablecoin industries eventually are going to be much, much bigger. I think it's just logical um, because the U.S. dollar stablecoin ecosystem is already so big. So let's talk about some some different types of stablecoins, right? The most basic one, and maybe a lot of you have already heard of, is uh, fiat-backed stablecoins. Um, the the two biggest examples of this is USDT uh, created in 2014 and also USDC created in 2018. 
They, these two are both Viet backed and they claim that they have reserves to issue one-to-one -one redeemability. Um, so conceptually, the easiest way to understand it is that they have a bank account um, and then people put in dollars, US dollars, and every dollar you put in, um, they will just create a um, ERC-20, uh, basically a, a, a token that lives on the blockchain and they'll issue that. Now, of course, you know, there's like, I think for Tether, there's billions of dollars that are, are in circulation. So does, does that mean that they have bank accounts that have billions of dollars? Probably not, right? There's there's a bit of a part, like a fractional reserve uh, type of banking system within this as well. Um, USDC does a little bit of a better job. It, they actually issue uh, third-party audits of their reserves every month. And what they actually say is that they um, they have cash and cash equivalents. So those can be treasury bonds uh, and things like that. Things that are you know very similar to, uh, you know you can have trust that they, they are going to be there and you can withdraw them. Um, but you know they also use that to earn a little bit of yield so that they can fund the operation that they're doing. So with billions and billions of dollars, you can imagine if, even if you have 0.01% yield on um, that, they can still make a lot of money like that. And, and you know they, they're not putting everything into those those uh, treasury bonds either. So that's kind of how these things work, right? It's dollars into a bank account and then they make these tokens. Um, so these tokens have the most trust behind them because they're they're backed by real fiat dollars, supposedly. Now, um, there's another type called crypto backed. Uh, and so MakerDAO actually creates this uh, token called DAI, D-A-I. And then that is another USD peg stable coin. Um, the way it works in the beginning was that people would put Ether, so the, the token from the Ethereum uh, blockchain, people would put that, lock it up into what they call a vault, and then be able to mint or create these DAI tokens. And there is a certain liquid liquidation threshold for this. So for example, if you want to mint $100 of DAI, um, then you need to put in at least $150 of uh, Ether. Right. Um, eventually, they actually created a lot more of um, different diverse things you can use as the collateral. So you can use WBTC, so basically a form of Bitcoin on top of the Ethereum blockchain, or even USDC as well. And then each of these um, these different collateral types will have different percentage levels. So maybe because USDC is so uh, stable, um, then they don't really mind. Uh, they don't need to force you to do 150 percent. Um, and I think they do like 110 a long time ago, and it became 101%, uh, something like that, because historically, USDC hasn't changed its peg that much. And then so that allows them to have these uh, this ability to mint these DAI tokens that are pegged U uh, to one US dollar, because it's always over collateralized by a certain amount, right? Ether and Bitcoin being a lot more volatile, that's why they have a uh, percentage around 150% or so. And, and there's those numbers change as well. Um, but um, th I think that's what it was when it first launched. Uh, and th these things, um, you know, it will continue to evolve. So DAI is actually backed by a diverse range of crypto assets. Like I said before, Ether, Bitcoin, USDC, and, and a whole bunch of other ones as well. Um, so th these are known as crypto backed stable coins, and they are usually over collateralized, right? That's the most important thing to know. Uh, one other thing to know is that um, what happens when the, the collateral goes down a lot, goes below that threshold, right? Let's say it goes below 150%. Well, there's a liquidation that is triggered, and there's an auction for people to basically buy that part of their collateral and be able to burn the die. And so, so there's a whole system in place to, to keep the peg in it. And it's held up very well over the last, I think, four years now, maybe even five. Um, so so the, these are things that I think the ecosystem still has a lot of confidence in. Now, one thing that a lot of people don't have a lot of confidence is algorithm-backed stablecoins. Now, there, there's a, a really famous one um, that I think we all heard of, Terra and UST. Um, and th that one is uh, is actually a little bit more complicated. They use a two token system, but it falls within the same category. Um, you know, but, but I have a more simple and a, a bit actually also a, a more earlier example that I, I want to share with you guys. Uh, this is called Ampleworth. It was created in 2018. It was a very pioneering algorithmic stablecoin. This allows it to um, the, the way it works is that it has elastic supply. And then so every, I forgot how long it was, maybe 12 hours or a certain amount of time, um, 
basically the smart contract will look at everything right and they will look at what is the price of the ample worth token because they want to target one dollar right if the price is more than one dollar then everyone just gets more tokens <laughs> and if the price is less than one dollar then everyone will just take they will take away tokens so basically you have your wallet and your number will just go up and down depending on on what is the the supply and demand situation what is the price in the last epoch right so it, it's a really interesting um dynamic right because you can't really use them it, it kind of breaks composability in other places where you know a lot of other systems might assume like oh this wallet has this many tokens um you know they don't assume that it's going to change on a dynamic basis like that um this is just one of the few examples of algo bad stable coins there's other systems that use um incentive mechanisms to basically incentivize people to to buy more um or or incentivize people to lock up right and the thing about algorithms, algorithmic stable coins is that it's um, it's really quite still an active area of research. And, and there's nothing that people that really like trust in the long term. There's some stuff like um, Frax, uh, which is a fractionally backed stable coin. It's a kind of a hybrid between what we talked about before, uh, where it's backed by some USDC, for example, and, and like maybe 80% of the time is USDC and then 20% is using this mechanism. So these are all things that I'm not going to go too much into because we're trying to cap cover a lot of different stuff here. But um, but that's kind of the basics of what that is. You can drill into that more when you have time. I see um, um, mean you posted something here. So let me um, answer this in the chat here. Does taking and giving supply for LPs too, does Ample World use rebasing mechanisms for that? Yeah, so I think when... when <laughs> For Ampleworth, that's ex exactly one point in which like that fails, right? Um, because when you are uh, taking and giving supplies uh, for LPs, um, and what is LPs, we will talk about that in the future uh, after a few, a few more slides. But basically, um, when you supply liquidity, you put your, put your tokens into a liquidity pool, you don't technically own that token, you own um, the right to withdraw from that pool, right? So, so the number of tokens you're actually entitled to can be very different. So it, depending on how the rebase happens and also how the liquidity pool works, right? Um, it could be fine, actually. I, I think like if you're talking about a very simple Uniswap V2 um, type of uh, system, then um, I, I don't think it would actually affect anything because everyone gets the same um, same uh, up and down type of thing, right? Everyone gets the same supply uh, sub uh, retraction and supply increase. So I, I, I think like it really depends on the pool itself and how it's administered. Uh, um, I'm sorry if I don't have a better answer for that, but that's that's what I can think of off the top of my head. So um, let's see what the next slide is. Okay, so here is just a a summary of what we talked about in the stablecoin section, right? On the left here, you have you know what's considered most stable, and on the right side, you have like least stable. As I said, you know. You know, what are some some of these uh, these fiat backed stable coins? They're backed by real assets in a bank account. And a lot of times they're subject to government oversight, like USDC, for example. If you need to mint and burn, you might have to KYC. Um, so like, like basically give your information to the government because they go through, um, there's an actual bank account that re receives and sends out dollars, right? So that's kind of the issue there. Um, in the middle, you have the crypto backed stable coins, like the DAI that we talked about. Um, it's worked by over collateralizing crypto assets. Um, it can be trustless, but you have to be, you know, very careful about the liquidation system. Um, it also needs to be over collateralized. So that's like, you can say that's not very efficient because you have all this extra assets that are just sitting there just, you know, to be safe, right? But it's a trade-off of different things. So, and, and finally, algorithm backed, right? Um, you know, it can be extremely dangerous as we all know, um, but it, it's also really interesting. And I think it's worth taking a look at um, you know, the different types of models that are out there, including the hybrid solutions that exist. So that's that section on stable coins. Um, any questions about stable coins? I'm going to move on to AMMs afterwards. I'll pause for a second here. I think uh, stable coins looks like a bank. Uh, it's very similar. Currently, a uh, traditional bank system has some problem with bank run. So some mm. uh, traditional bank have some uh, bankrupt uh, by bank uh, bank run, fast bank run. So uh, what 
bank run looks like in stable coin mm -hmm. and stable coin is safe with bank run Yes, that's a really good question. So different types of stable coins will behave differently, but certainly bank runs happen all the time within the, the crypto industry with stable coins. I think the most recent one people can remember is probably what happened with Terra Luna. Um, you know, with that particular one, there was um, whenever bank runs happen, it's basically a type of stress test on the system, whether or not it can hold the peg, right? And with Terra Luna, it failed to do that because uh, there's a lot of different reasons, but there's, um, you know, one of the biggest reasons was that it is very unstable system with the two token system. Um, I think they tried to back it with partially by buying a whole bunch of Bitcoin, but then the price of Bitcoin also went down a lot and that caused a lot of the confidence to go down and more people exited at the same time. Um, with the crypto back staple coins, actually DAI suffered a very big bank run uh, situation about three years ago. Um, and what happened was everyone, uh, you know, how I talk about your collateral needs to be over collateralized, right? Um, I think it was such a bear market that the price of Ether went down so much that a lot of these loans became under collateralized. And then so people were rushing to buy DAI on the market so they can return it to the system and save their collateral. And that included myself. I actually lost a lot of money through that as well. Um, what happens in that situation is actually... Um, there was in a short term, it drove the price of DAI very, very, very high, right? Because there's so much like instant demand for it. And then they also realized that the liquidation system was not efficient enough. There were not many bidders. There was, I think, only like a couple of different bots. So when people actually, people actually lost all of their collateral when when if there it was a more efficient system, maybe you would only lose a portion of your collateral. And then, so these these are things that are. Um, you know, we've seen in the past few years, um, a very similar scenario to bank runs. And, and I think within the ecosystem, we're learning about different systems, um, trying to create more and more robust systems to handle these kind of stress tests. Uh, but definitely, these are things that, you know, people think about when, when they are designing stable coins. And we have a lot of experience now, um, but there's still a lot more to learn about. Um, yeah, I think me, you pointed out the um, the thing about USDC depegged recently and the need of algo stable coins so that it can react a little bit faster. That's another very interesting thing that happened. Like I think it was a few weeks ago or or a month or a couple of months ago. Uh, basically, um, because of USDC's uh, parent company Circle, they they have a lot of uh, bank accounts that that hold the US dollars that back the USDC. Um, one of them was, I think, SVB, Silicon Valley Bank. And one of the issues was that uh, people didn't know if, if there was a lot of money in there that's going to be gone. And, like, you know, maybe USDC will be worthless. And then so there was a lot of fear. Um, but then a lot of the, the issues were is because things cannot happen on the weekend. So there was no real answer about what is the real result until Monday. And it's because a lot of things happened Friday. So over Saturday and Sunday, the USDC price went down a lot, a lot. Um, but then on, on very, very quickly, when Monday came around, there was a lot of news about how the FDIC was going to help out um, and other, other things that came to light. And by Tuesday, uh, basically, it was back to $1. So it was, it was another interesting thing to kind of see the system, right? The, the traditional finance system and the decentralized finance system. Sometimes, you know, when you have a system that relies on both, there can be a bit of a mismatch, right? Like, you know, USDC, um, they they rely on both sides, right? They're kind of the bridge of both sides. So so when one, one thing moves a lot and the other one can't move, you have these kind of market dislocations, these issues here. I think that's very really interesting. Um, I'll, I'll move on, uh, if, if no one else has any other questions, to automated market makers. So automated market makers, what is an AMM, right? Um, this is a really important building block in the decentralized finance. They are basically decentralized exchanges um, and they use a certain formula to, to find the price of what the token should be. Now, traditionally um, in an ordinary exchange or like even centralized exchanges or like your regular stock exchanges, there is always buyers and sellers. Like if they have what's called an order book system. So, uh, 
people would would put their order onto like a big board and say, "Hey, I want to buy this this uh, token or this security, this uh, this stock for this price." And then someone else would be like, "Oh, I want to sell for this price." And then you have basically a whole system, like like hundreds, maybe thousands of people saying different things about what they want to buy at what price, what they want to sell at what price. And on, on the other side of that, you have people who are called market makers, and, and they basically take the other side of some of these things. Because you know, if, if no one moves the market, people can get stuck and there's no sale or no, like basically no buying and selling going on. So so people are are usually uh, um they're organizations that are market makers that basically take the other side of a lot of these trades so that the market can can move and, and go efficient move efficiently and, and they they make the spread they're basically the gap between the, the you know the buy orders and the sell orders now in an amm an automated market maker it's very different on the right side here you can see there's like a there's like a curve and this is the x times y equals k curve this a very simple formula basically drives the whole uh, amm system what well, every time you you in an amm when you exchange between token a and token b you're interacting with one pool and in this one big pool you have a bunch of token a and you have a bunch of token b the way that the price is determined is based on how many tokens are in the pool so if there's like a lot of token a and not many token b then token b is going to be more, more expensive Compared to when sometimes maybe there's a lot of token B, not many token A, then conversely, it'll be token A that's expensive instead. So on this curve, as you can see, the quantity of the tokens, or more specifically, the ratio of what the tokens are, either more token A or token B, will determine what the price is. And every time someone trades, you change that ratio, and you actually push the price in one direction or the other. And I think this diagram really explains it quite well. Um, in, in actuality, it really is not that complicated of, of an idea, but um, it is very powerful because it allows these automated systems that are a lot more um, efficient in terms of calculations and, and infrastructure. You don't need to create a whole order book system that, you know, order book systems also need to like operate really, really quickly. Um, so, so this is like one of the innovations that, that um, have been possible because of the blockchain um, and, and, um, and uh, you know, this AMMs. Um, I think it's also important to mention that before AMMs, there was also decentralized exchanges too. Um, the first decentralized exchanges on Ethereum was um, Ether Delta, I believe. That, at least that was the, the first uh, popular one. And it was basically a traditional order book system. And then you can kind of see people submit their orders and you can like click on the order and you can accept the order. Um, it, it was like, it looked very much like a traditional stock trading platform, but it was uh, a lot slower and uh, a lot more expensive, I, I would say. And a lot of people would like, you know, basically take the wrong order or they typed in the wrong number and they would lose a lot of money. It was very inefficient, but it was, it was interesting to see how the industry shifted from that you know, from imitating the original like stock exchanges um, to kind of creating its own new way of uh, um, exchanges. And there's a little bit more history to this too. I think the first automated market, um, our AMM exchange was actually in some kind of game, like before the blockchain, like some kind of game like World of Warcraft, where there was some system where people can buy and sell and it was just like this. So, so it's important to know the concept itself you know, of course, x times y equals k is not super, super new. But, uh, you know, the technology coupled with this concept allows us to do something that didn't exist before. Um, on the other side of things is liquidity providing, right? Because we talked about there are market makers that take the other side. Um, what about for uh, AMMs? There is, uh, these people are called LPs, or liqu liquidity providers. And you basically, if you want to be an LP, what you want, you can earn is that you can earn a portion of each trade. So each trade, I, I believe at the time was like 0.3% or 0.03% um, in Uniswap. Every trade, part of that goes back to the pool. And then so you can join the pool by providing some of your liquidity. So in this uh, screenshot I found online, there's a token, there's a big pool and there's two tokens in there. There's a bunch of Ether and there's a bunch of B52. I don't know what B52 is, but it was just part of the screenshot. So 
let's say you you want you don't mind being exposed to the price changes in ether and b52 uh you just want to put your money there and maybe make a little bit of earn a little bit of the uh the, the trading fees so you would put you would take basically half ether and half b52 you put it into the pool and then you will have a certain share of that pool and you get these tokens these they're called pool tokens and, and more specifically, people call them LPTs because you're a liquidity provider. There's a liquidity provider or sorry, liquidity pool tokens, right? LP tokens. Um, this token basically tells you that you are entitled to a certain amount of the pool, okay? So in this case, in the, in the screenshot, you can see that uh, this user has deposited a bunch of Ether and B52 and they own 4.517 pool tokens. What are these pool tokens? Well, they allow you to redeem 6.01% of the entire pool. So it's all of the LPs, all of the people providing liquidity are kind of gathered into this pool. And when, when you put your money in, you're, you're given uh, a receipt and sometimes they call it receipt tokens to basically represent your stake or your share of the, uh, the pool itself. Um, this is really interesting because you know this proof that you, you put some money into the pool um, or you're entitled to a certain amount of pool is something that you can take somewhere else and you can actually get yield on them. And, and, and there's like a lot of things you can do. Um, you know, so that's, that's something that's really interesting. Um, but you know, all this drives is like something like Uniswap. If, if some of you have never used Uniswap before, I, I highly recommend you try, uh, you know, making some swaps, right? I mean, swap, you know, is not maybe a common term in regular day-to-day -day life, but um, on, on uh, in crypto, it's actually quite simple. You're just swapping for one thing for another thing. You can see here uh, right now the UI is, you know, I want to buy some USDC. I want to buy one Ether USDC. And then you just type in one and then and you hit the swap button and that's it. There's a lot of other numbers telling you kind of, you know, exchange rate and you know, the gas fee. And this is kind of like an old screenshot, I think. Um, but, you know, these are the kind of things um, that's possible uh, with an AMM. And, and, you know, we talk a lot about the different complicated things, but at the end of the day, this is what we're trying to create, right? The experience of being able to just swap one token for another token. Um, any questions ab about that uh, before I move on? No. Okay. So, uh, lending and borrowing markets. Lending and borrowing markets are quite interesting because, you know, this is one of the core building blocks of a financial system. You know, the ability to uh, lend your money to someone else or the ability to borrow it from someone else, you know, it increases the capital efficiency uh, of an economy. Um, you know, what's the, the whole point of holding a whole bunch of money if other people want to borrow it and you don't mind letting them borrowing it? Um, well, there's like an exchange there. So on point number two here, you can see that, you know, there are people with a whole bunch of assets and, you know, instead of letting it sit around, they can earn some yield by helping others, right? Because other people might want to borrow it, um, you know, they, and, and then so you're actually making the economy more efficient if you put your assets to work. Um, and on the borrowing side, um, you know, if you want to borrow some tokens and you are willing to pay someone for that, you know, then... You know that's worth it for you financially. Um, at the same time, it's also worth it for the lenders because then you know now they're making some yield off of their assets. So borrowing lending is really important part of the economy, um, and that's really the whole what the whole slide's about. Um, and I, I don't think I need to convince you guys of that. It's very similar to getting a mortgage to buy a house, right? If everyone had to wait until they have one hundred percent the price of the house, then uh, a lot of times, all that money is just stuck in the bank account waiting to accumulate, right? And then there's a lot of issues with that, you know, inflation and also just the capital not being uh, being put to work. So let's go to the next one here. This is kind of, this is from Aave, uh, A-A-V-E. This is a very popular lending protocol and it has a pretty good UI. Actually, I'm not sure if this is Aave or Compound. They're very, very similar. I think this is Aave, actually. Um Anyway, so on the left side, you can see these are all the assets that I can supply into the ecosystem, into, into the, basically this whole lending and borrowing pool, uh, these smart contracts. I can give the protocol some Ether, for example, right? And, and I could get a certain percentage of yield. 
you can see here under the APY, it says like 1.7% for Ether, 2.97% for USDC, and then so on and so forth. The whole idea here is that this is the percentage you of yield you can earn if you put your Ether or, or USDC into the system. Um, and that's to incentivize you to do that. And where does that yield come from? It comes from people that want to borrow it, right? So on the right side here, you can see these are assets that can be borrowed. Um, uh, you know, we, you can ignore the um, stable APY. I mean, th that's that's not that important. But looking at the APY variable on the right side, the 3.95%, 3.88%, people are trying to borrow uh, these kind of tokens from the system. And then that in turn allows it to... Um, allows people to have yield when they supply them as well. Uh, the way it works is, is that you can actually supply and borrow at the same time. So let's say I can put in like $1,000 worth of ETH and I can borrow $500 worth of DAI, for example. And there, there is like a certain percentage. So it is also over collateralized lending. So DAI is kind of like this as well. Um, but the, the reason why people would like to do this is maybe you want to speculate, right? Let's say you believe that Ether is going to be worth a lot more, 10 times what it is today, right? But you need to get some of the money now so you can use it to, uh, to get more yield or to like pay your uh, tuition or, or pay your rent or something like that. So you need DAI right now for some reason, uh, but you don't want to sell your Ether for DAI. So what you can do is you can lock your Ether in here uh, and then you can like borrow some DAI to do your thing. And then maybe one year later, Ether is 10 times higher. Then you can sell some of the Ether, uh, pay back your loan. And then now you actually was able to make use of the capital that you had before instead of having to you know sell it when it was, the price was low. And this is like obviously you know a type of speculation, but it is one of the major use cases of um, these borrowing lending systems. Um, that, that really is pretty much it about borrowing lending, but, you know, I think it's important for everyone to know that it's over collateralized and that, you know, it, it's, these are like, you know, multi-billion dollar marketplaces, um, you know, very important for, for how uh, decentralized finance works. Now, uh, on to another thing called yield farming. Uh, I don't have a lot of good screenshots for this, and it sounds really weird, but yield farming is basically just collecting interest on uh, a stake. Right. So we already talked about some of the other stuff before, how you can um, get some kind of, uh, uh, you know, yield where you can get a rewarded percentage when you put your money somewhere. Um, this is basically the same thing, except uh, a lot of people, you will also get some reward tokens on top of that. And that's actually called liquidity mining. I mean, these are all big words, but really all it is, is you put your tokens over here. And then someone else will give you some reward tokens to thank you for that, right? Or like they, they want to encourage you to do that because they want you to put your money with their platform, right? It's very similar to how a regular bank, you know, you, they want to give you um, uh, some benefits. You know, they say, oh, we'll give you good service if you put your money with us. Um, it's really basically the same thing, right? They're just different words and yeah, but they really mean the same thing. So, you know, I'll just read through these points here. Yield farming is basically just earning rewards by staking or lending assets on DeFi platforms. Um, I think that's very straightforward. It's basically what I just said. Um, and now some of these could be, uh, in terms of reward tokens, it could be governance tokens. Uh, so some people would actually like put their money somewhere and then they would earn some governance tokens and then maybe every day they would sell some uh, or maybe they would collect them. Right. Uh, and then there's like really interesting incentive schemes too. like some of the governance tokens. If you lock it up for two years, uh, maybe they will you'll get even higher reward percentage. And then so you can lock up even more and get even more percentage. And then there's like a maximum. There's a lot of very interesting schemes like this um, for, for yield farming. Um, but the whole point is to basically make sure that the system is more liquid so people can there's a lot of what they call mercenary liquidity and people just like move money everywhere, wherever, oh, the percentage is higher over here. Okay, let's go there. 
percentage over here is better. So we go there. And so it, it is extremely fluid compared to the traditional retail banking market, right? Because it's so much harder to, you know, if you have two banks, like a regular retail bank, take all the money out from one and go to the other. Um, there's a lot more friction compared to in DeFi. Although now there's less friction. And that some people say that's why there was a big issue with um, the recent uh, um, you know, bank runs. Um, all right. So obviously, you know, you know, these things cannot sound really fun, but uh, we have to talk about the risks. You know, it, it can be very volatile um, and there's like other risks. Actually, we'll, we'll, we'll get back to that, but just want to show you a quick uh, screenshot here. This is Curve Finance, which is a stable coin AMM. So it allows people to very efficiently swap between different types of stable coin. You can see here the first pool is called the three pool, the DAI, USDC and USDT pool. So in this pool, people can, you know, uh, LPs can supply a bunch of DAI, USDC, USDT, and this allows them the ability to uh, provide liquidity and earn this percentage on the right here. This percentage on the right side, you see 0.10%. That's the percentage you get from uh, basically, they call it the base virtual APY, but basically it's the yield that you get from the swap fees. So every time people swap between DAI, USDC, USDT, um, you know, you'll get a certain percentage. And then the yield from that that you'll get is the 0.1% essentially. But there's also, you see the second line here, 0.28 percentage to 0.69 percentage. That is the variable curve reward token. So curve finance has its own governance token called CRV. And then these CRV tokens is basically the tokens that they created out of thin air and they're just rewarding you almost like a loyalty points program right um you know like like air miles kind of thing and then if you and the reason why it's a range is that if you lock up some tokens you get like a 2.5x boost so instead of if you don't lock up any tokens it's just 0.28 percentage um curve tokens that you get as reward but if you want even more curve tokens as reward then if you then you should lock up some of these tokens for maybe four years and you get the maximum amount of curve tokens. So you can kind of see the, the dynamics in play here where they're trying to encourage people to lock up these tokens for more tokens. Um, and it gets a little bit circular like that, but it, but it is really interesting in, in the way that these things work. And this screenshot is actually quite old. I think it's maybe two or three years old even. Um, maybe not three years old, but like two years old, I'm pretty sure. You can see the TVL, the total value locked for these pools is already very high. And these are US dollars. So, you know, 1.6 billion US dollars of these stable coins in just one pool two years ago. Uh, you, it can, you can kind of see the scale of this uh, um, industry growing really fast. It's much higher than it is now. I think like now it's even higher, um, probably like three or four billion. I, I don't have the actual number. I have to look it up. But, um, you know, for anyone still, Kind of thinking, oh, this is just some, you know, DeFi, DeFi is just some toy that people are playing with. You know, it, it's very different. I, th I think it's getting much more mainstream than people think. And then so, you know, that's one thing to keep in mind. This is a very, very old screenshot. I think their UI doesn't even look like this anymore. They have a new UI coming out. So um, I think we'll take a quick break um, uh, for any questions uh, before I get into flash loans. I, I have to rest my voice for uh, five seconds here as well. Oh, wow. Okay, so it's a pretty long question here. Let me get from uh, Min Chorison. Let me give, give me a second to read through this. I'm going to read through this out. Through the lecture, I can learn the strengths of DeFi. However, in my opinion, their decentralized and unmodifiable aspects sometimes became very, very huge security accidents compared to traditional bank systems. That is true. I'm actually one of those people who is quite negative on DeFi, given the scale of incidents, such as Euler Finance. It seems that there is still too much money tied up in an experimental system with high risk. That's also very true. So my question is this, do you think it is desirable for the Web3 market to be as big as it is? I think it's hard to make any normative claims about how things should be, how things should not be, because I, I'm not God. All I can point to is you know, what is uh, happening right now. Um, I think it's important for people to experiment, uh, but I also think people need to be educated and be aware of the risks. Uh, now, some people might say, like, maybe the government needs to stop people from doing this because, you know, regular people, they don't have the education for it. 
I think that is more of a political discussion, and I, I don't, you know, I don't have any strong opinions there. But yeah. excuse me. But yes, one of the things we will talk about, I think, five more slides is the um, <clears throat> sorry. I think you need a break. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. To be it's honest, be... Uh, 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 why you break? Uh, I I don't like to share my experience in DeFi. Uh, I used the DeFi uh, since 2018, maybe 19, uh, when DeFi started. Uh, for example, Compound. I just uh, try to use Compound, and then. Uh, I never use compound anymore because I don't need that kind of uh, swap needs. But one year later or two years later, they said they will issue unit token, and then <laughs> you they will give me some free unit token, and and I I get that unit token, and it was huge. The price is very big and it was huge. Wow. <laughs> they give me very free token. Even I just use one, one time, just the one time, maybe one time or two times. So I was very surprised. And I think DeFi, uh, we, we need some education to use DeFi, but there are tons of different DeFi's. So, uh, even though I live in, uh, I work for blockchain space and crypto space, I don't understand each DeFi in detail. So uh, I'm very frustrated to use DeFi service. I'm very worried about, uh, I totally understand this DeFi or uh, is there any security holes? Uh, I'm not sure. So, so uh, in this perspective, uh, I cannot, I cannot, I cannot uh, assure DeFi will, will be accepted to normal people, average people, because average people don't want to ed be educated. They, they want to rely on intermediary like bank because they don't want to they don't want to study a lot and they don't have any uh, capability to follow on uh, follow on the improvement of DeFi or uh, financial service. So, so I think, uh, so there is some very big gap between crypto uh, people and average persons. Yeah, I, I think that's a that's a really good point. Um, I, I think we have to think about the different things that you can do with DeFi and what people need for day to day life, right? I think most people when they take loans, it's usually maybe a student loan or a loan to buy a house, um, and, and only if you are a business owner then maybe you will take business loans, right? I think in the future, I agree there will be some kind of intermediaries that make the the UX much easier. Um, but I also think like very simple things like just getting some yield, you know, there will probably be yield aggregators, right? Like Yearn or back then or like Pickle Finance. Basically, they will, you know, they, ha they will have very robust smart contracts that simply help you gain yield. And that'll be very similar to what people do right now with, with banks. And then, you know, they take a cut of the profit from that yield. Uh, I, I think it's also really important not to infantilize people too much. I remember in 1996, 1997, you know, people, you know, people were getting scammed all the time from the internet. And actually, I don't know if some of you guys remember, I, you know, everyone says never put your credit card on the internet. It's so dangerous, right? Now everyone is buying things on the internet. Uh, and then at the same time, you know, back then people say, oh, don't use your real name because, uh, you know, you don't want people to like take your, steal your identity and things like that. I think it's important like, not only to always just trust intermediaries, but we have to understand that we can do a lot more work as an industry to improve the user experience. 
so that people can understand better, right? Um, there will always be things that uh, people are too lazy to learn about. And, and I agree, like they don't need to learn about everything. But I think people, I, I have very, I'm very optimistic on humanity. I think people can learn more than you think if the UX is good and if there's a good reason to do it. Now, you know, again, we are still in very early days, in my opinion. Uh, you know, like, uh, like, like our friend here, Mintra said, uh, you know, the Euler finance hack and things like that. There's going to be more of these things happening um, as, you know, as the industry grows. But I think, you know, we will also learn throughout the process in the same way that people learn to use email. You know, people learn to, I mean, even now people don't really use that very well, right? Like there's people save the email and the password. Maybe they just write the password down on a piece of paper and then they just put it on the table. Like, like things like that. I, I think, you know, nothing in life is ever perfect. But I, I do think that, you know, the power of these things and all the people working on improving the usability, all the people working with governments, um, you know, like, you know, I, I think there is very, very much things to look forward to. Uh, just because some really bad things happen uh, doesn't mean that, you know, there isn't a lot more really interesting things um, going forward. Uh, and, and in the same way, you know, I, I also use Compound way back and, and I haven't really used it much since. But I, I understand why other people might want to use it. And I understand if other people use it and it's helpful to them, um, you know, they can create an econ economic activity that can be beneficial for the entire ecosystem as well. So it's important to look at things holistically. Whenever you have like technology um, that is really powerful, I think you're going to have a lot of negative effects. But then the positive effects are also there. And, and I think, you know, we have to kind of take the good and the bad and think about you know, we, we can't dismiss the whole system and dismiss the whole technology. We have to think about how can we, uh, you know, maybe create some of those intermediaries um, to help protect some people. Um, but at the same time, you know, like as technology changes, we have to change as a society as well. Um, so I, I, think, I think I'm actually going to cut it very close to the time. So I, I'm going to try to go through some of these slides really quickly here. Okay. <laughs> Oh, so flash loans, one of the really interesting things um, uh, that happened in, uh, from, from the blockchain is these things called flash loans. Um, a lot of people sometimes think, oh, like de decentralized finance is the same as regular finance. It's not any different. But this is one thing that is only possible on uh, blockchain and is not possible in traditional finance. I mean, I mean it's, you can kind of simulate it, but with a lot of trust, right? But this one actually is really interesting because... Um, it, it basically allows anyone to become a millionaire or like a 20 millionaire, 100 millionaire for, for one second, essentially. Um, so flash loans are a type of DeFi lending that allows you to borrow, th borrow money with no collateral as long as it happens within one transaction. And so this, will, this basically allows massive capital access for literally anyone, right? It could be a bot, right? As long as your transaction is able to be profitable so it can pay the loan back um, after the end of the transaction. This, this, this is possible because each transaction on the blockchain is atomic. So one transaction can have many steps within it, right? So in a flash loan, what you want to do is basically you borrow all this money, you do something with it, you earn money, and then you return it all back, right? Um, this, is, this has a lot of usage, like with arbitrage, you can swap collateral from one, one to another. Um, you can use it to prevent liquidity, liquidation by just grabbing a whole bunch of money to, to like move things around. Um, you know, a bot can do all this for you and really just anything that's uh, possible. And why this is important is not only because it gives access to people um, to have a lot of money to work with, but also it gives more, um, all this money that is like kind of stuck on an exchange or a lending market, it makes it useful. Right, like you have like a hundred million dollars, a couple billion dollars, it's on the exchange, um, it's on the smart contract, but it's kind of stuck there, right? But if this can actually, you know, be it can like within one transaction can go do something that's useful and then come back, you know, that makes the market a lot more efficient as well. Um, you know, th that's just a, lot of, a lot of words, but I found a very simple diagram to really explain what flash loans do. Um, basically, step one. You know, there's a big money pot on the left here. You can imagine that's kind of like Uniswap or Aave. You can take the flash loan. Number two, you can go wild, do whatever you want. 
And as long as you finish number three, you can repay the loan plus like maybe a small amount of interest, um, a fee, then this transaction can, can work. And, and so this is not only can you do flash loans, there's something else actually, I, I wasn't able to find too much information called flash mintable assets. So you can actually almost artificially, in, artificially inflate a certain type of supply um, which really gives you so much more capital efficiency um, if, you know, depending on what you're trying to do. Um, I don't have too much information on, on flash mintable assets, but that's another area of research um, that is possible thanks to the blockchain and, and its atomic transactions. And basically, if you're not able to replay the loan, the, base, the transaction just would not happen. It, it would not be valid. The validators will not take it. So um, maybe it's a little bit hard to kind of explain um, but then the concept itself is very simple. You take you take a whole bunch of money, do something with it. As long as you pay back the interest, the whole transaction is valid, and it will get um, mined or validated, added to the logo. Anyway, so uh, I'll wrap it up here. This is basically the final section. Uh, we're going to talk about some of the the meta things, governance. There's different types of governance. Um, you know, we talked about about who controls some of these things. What if people like uh, you know they they just take centralized control and then you will lose all your money um how do you change different parameters you know we'll go through this really quickly um you know the very basic way these are different types of voting um one type of voting it, it, it seems very stupid but you know maybe on a discord chat or like discourse forum people would just vote like with like emojis and things like things like that and then you know the team that people trust um, maybe they'll do something, right? But of course, this is not very binding. It's not accurate. It doesn't even require you to hold any tokens. It's just whoever is there to, to press the button. But but it is very fast and convenient. So if you have an active um, community and you just kind of want to see what people feel, like, oh, do you want to do this? Or, or do you, you want to do something else? You know, this could be a, a viable way of doing it. And, and you know, as as like uh, inaccurate as this is, uh, this is this is very common because there are many active online communities, and and this is a quick and easy way of seeing what people feel like doing. Obviously, this will this is more for like centralized um, projects where where the team still has a lot of control, or maybe it's kind of just one way to to see what everyone feels like before you take it to the next level. Um, so the, one of these next levels is maybe snapshot voting. Snapshot voting basically takes a snapshot as a certain block number to see how many tokens everyone has, right? And then the votes are assigned with tokens wallet. So you connect with your wallet and you can sign um, uh, how many tokens you have and what you want to vote for, right? And this is done off chain. It's stored on IPFS. And then everyone takes all these like uh, uh, votes and put it together. and Essentially, the snapshot and the IPFS system will take all this and, and then write the result on chain. Um, there, there is, um, you know, that so-called decentralized nature to it um, be, because you, you're still signing with your with your wallet. So you're um, you only get to vote with how many tokens you own at that specific snapshot. Um, but you are still kind of trusting the snapshot system to put the right answer on on chain. And also just because they put this answer on chain doesn't mean it's going to change the exact same thing, right? This is still just a signal for the team. And they look at this and they're like, oh, okay, fine. Everyone votes this, so we'll do it. But there's no guarantee that they will make that change, right? Um, so of course, finally, the most secure way of doing is on-chain voting. So this is where everything happens on a blockchain. Um, but now even every single vote is on chain. So it meant, that means you have to pay gas a certain fee every time you make a vote. But the benefit of this, this is like, you know, where, where security is top priority and you have very high stake vote, the smart contract will look at basically what number is higher, what, what which vote won, and it would automatically make the change in the protocol itself. So it would directly change it. You don't have to wait for a team to look at the result and then decide to make the change, right? Um, so this is as decentralized as it gets, um, and it, it'll automatically do it because this is what's written in the smart contract. And so just a real quick recap of this, you know, forum votes, snapshot votes, on-chain votes, there's from least mutable to the most mutable. And, and really only on-chain votes can you really trust things are... are are done, which is where it's really trustless. With both with forum votes and snapshot votes, you're really still trusting the team to follow the will of the result of the, uh, to follow the result of the, of the poll 
of the voting, essentially. Um, let's talk about some security risks and wrap it up because I know it's already 2.30 or, or uh, 5.30 for you guys. Um, okay, smart contract risks, right? We talked about this a little bit, you know, like very simple things like, you know, smart contract flaws can be exploited, like random errors and things like that sometimes can lead to a large amount of issues. Um, external dependencies, I think is probably the biggest thing uh, when there's, when your smart contract mm. depends on a, a value that's outside of itself. Um, you know, there's a huge possibility of what's called an economic attack. One, one very uh, common example is Oracle manipulation. So let's say you have a protocol that is, will liquidate or you because of depending on the price of Ether or, some, or price of some token, right? Well, somebody can use a flash loan and then maybe they can go on Uniswap and sell or buy a lot of one token. They will change the price of the token within a transaction. And then now they can go back to the other protocol and it's like, hey, look, the chain, the, the price changed. So you, you should do this instead. And then, so basically you can really manipulate a lot of things if you can see how the different smart contracts interact with each other. And this is why a lot of, um, actually Uniswap V2 uh, included something called a TWAP, right? Time weighted average price. So there's a basically a bit of a delay so that people can't do all these things within one transaction, uh, can't manipulate the price. So pe when people re reference a price from Uniswap, they no longer are referencing the current price, but they will reference the time weighted average price to reduce the ability for someone to manipulate a price like that. And in so many of the smart contracts, um, the smart contract hacks are done through something like this. Um, of course, there's much more complicated ones as well, but this is like one of the, the examples here. Social attacks, Ponzi schemes, uh, where basically new users' money will pay use old users' money. Um, and you know everything will look great until one day uh, the whole thing collapsed because there's no more new people that wants to go in. It's very simple. I think everyone understands that. Phishing, um, actually, phishing has been a problem since the beginning of the internet. I remember when my parents like were, were looking at some internet website and I said, "Oh, that's not real. That's fake. Don't put your password in there." Right? Basically, um, a website, like, or they'll pretend to be a wallet website and they'll trick you to giving you your password, passphrase, secret key, and they have access to everything. Um, exit scams, leadership of projects, like a lot of projects are, are managed by multi-sigs, which are basically a multi-sig is a group of people that everyone has to sign before, or not everyone, but a certain number of people have to sign before something happens. So you're trusting that all the people within that group um, is uh, is someone that you tr trust is trustworthy. So leadership of these projects sometimes like maybe some people say it's a three or five uh, multi sig, but maybe three of those people are corrupt, or maybe all five is corrupt, right? And then so the project is not really decentralized in that sense because these five people control it, um, or the three people if you, if it's three or five multi sig. Um, so there have been a lot of like scams like this. Um, and um, not, even more simply than just like taking out some of um, taking out like like moving things out of the, your uh, out, out of like a group wallet or, or a smart contract. Some uh, it's not as common anymore, but uh, uh, some of the uh, tokens out there has a special mint function that only the creator can call, and apparently they can just print unlimited tokens, and then that will basically destroy the price. They'll just print a billion, a trillion tokens. And they'll sell it for ether or something like that and then that will crush the price of everyone else um, so these are like different types of i, I categorize them as social attacks and these are the things to to be aware of there's definitely more to these things uh, but this is a good overview i think and of course there's regulatory risk right because DeFi is so new it's, it's a bit of a gray zone a lot of countries and their governments don't know how to regulate this stuff and i know this i i actually have a law degree as well um, so it, it's really interesting when I talk to people from the law school and I talk to people from the DeFi space, it, it very different uh, views on things. But but I, I think like both sides should probably talk to each other. So there's more clarity on what makes sense and on, on what is, um, you know, safer for, for regular people. Um, there's also, as we can see in other countries, uh, can be very sudden changes, right? Like, for example, a place like uh, China, they can just ban all trading, like all one day. And then immediately, you know, everything you do, maybe you have to move your business outside of the country. These are things that are very burdensome. <clears throat> so I, I think there was a, 
uh, not too long ago, a lot of people actually moved companies outside, like from Hong Kong to Singapore or something like that. And then now Hong Kong is very pro Web3, so some people moving back. I don't know. It's it's very confusing, right? You never know if something's going to change again. Uh, sanctions, of course, Tornado Cash has been sanctioned by the U.S. under, under OFAC. Um, and then so USDC actually follows that compliance as well, so that they don't allow those uh, wallets to to move their USDC tokens. They basically freeze those assets. These are th some things to pay attention to as well. It's, you know, it, of course, it's a discussion about whether or not the sanctions are proper or not, but these are th risks that I think people should need to be aware of. And in conclusion, um, you know, it's an evolving space. I, I think it has a lot of benefits, but it also has a lot of risks like we talked about um, today. Um, I think it's important, however, to understand the different concepts and key innovations that we talked about. There's a lot more complicated stuff in there, for sure. Um, and also, you know, because it's so unique and, and has unique culture, um, they have very interesting governance models as well. They have different types of voting. You can get more voting power if you lock up your tokens, for example, in some cases. And, uh, you know, I, I think it's important to be careful, but I, I, I will say that you know just because there's some danger there's a lot of danger actually much like a lot a lot of danger but i think it will still have an extremely big impact on the way things will work in in, in the coming years so you know be careful um i think stay up to date and and just uh can see hopefully we can see it grow in a positive way and and help people going forward in the coming years and thank you for listening to my long presentation. Uh, my uh, ID is Adrian MCLI. Uh, you can find me on Twitter, Telegram. I use the same um, ID everywhere. So uh, you can just say hi or ask some questions. I'm happy to do that. Thanks everyone for your time. Um, yeah. Okay, any question? Maybe you are hungry. <laughs> it's dinner <Yeah>. time. <laughs> yeah. So uh, I'd like to uh, ask one last question. Uh, actually, I think the uh, most powerful advantage of DeFi is composability. Mm. So we can easily compose new financial service. So if we deploy this kind of infrastructure to developing country, they can make, they can build uh, financial infrastructure easily, easier than traditional way. But uh, in but the 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 disadvantage of composability is uh, bad effect is easily propagate propagating to other service. So when we design uh, this kind of DeFi contract or service, how can we consider? this kind of cascading effect or propagating effect of bad effect? Yeah, I, I think this is actually a, a really good question in terms of, um, it, it really reminds me of things with regards to software design, right? When you have different modules and they interact with each other, how can we have basically, um, you know, certainty about the interface between these contracts, between these modules, and how can we make sure that there's a level of security, um, you know, between them. And obviously, you know, the composability of DeFi is what gives its power, but it's also what gives it so much risk as, and so much danger as well. But that is really actually like from a more philosophical point of view, it is the issue with anything that reduces friction between uh, different sets of, of um, functionalities, right? Um, I think in the future, there will be a lot more standards talking about how this one type of system should interact with another type of systems. Um, standardized interfaces between modules, I think is going to be something that we'll see more of. I think one of the other things is just, you know, like we talked about previously, education, um, you know, this wholesale systems that are just more, more standardized and um, maybe even, you know, going to some of the discussions we had before, there could be more government involvement, whereas the government maybe have, mm. they will have some kind of voting that allows them to revert some transactions. Maybe that's, that. so it's, 
it really is quite an open question, but there's many different tools we can have to kind of give the option, right? It's not always like, you know, a lot of people, actually, I remember a few months ago, someone was making a, a EIP standard, an Ethereum standard about reversible transactions, giving someone the ability to reverse a transaction. <laughs> and maybe, you know, maybe in some countries it works for them, right? Uh, who knows? Uh, but it's it's weird sometimes, but, um, you know, there's there can be really interesting things um you know voting you know like like we said you know voting can can be non-linear right there's quadratic voting different crazy interesting things that can be experimented on um I, I think people are also because of all the hacks are quite aware of the risks now that you know when we have different systems so um you know be careful out there uh, i would say um and i hope that the governments are really talking to um, you know, different experts and, and being careful. Like, I don't think people should rush to it as, accept this kind mm. of stuff. I, I, I think people should experiment and be and learn, but really it, it's important that everyone be, be really, really careful with this kind of thing. Okay, good answer. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, thank you for your great uh, talk. Uh, actually, you address the whole spectrum of DeFi. So we understood a lot of things. So thank you. Thank you. There's a lot more that I'm still learning. So thank you, guys. Thanks for coming. Okay. Have a good dinner. Okay. Have thank a nice you. day. Yes. Thank, thank you, you to you all. Good night. Thank you. <laughs> Goodbye. Okay. 수고하셨습니다.